For this session, we will have Professor Er Huming, Dean of IMU Teaching and Learning, Mr. Robert Cairn Duff from Elsevier, and Mr. Scott Grillo from McGraw Hill Professional as the esteemed speakers, while Associate Professor Dr. Nilesh Kumar Mitra, Director of Learning Resources Department, will be the moderator. So, without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Nilesh to begin the session. A very good morning to all the participants uh, to knowledge and experience sharing uh, on a new norm in education. Uh, for the past uh, one and a half year since March 2020, when uh, this crisis of the pandemic has uh, started, all of us who are working in education sector, we are experiencing a massive change. Now it is time that when the pandemic is going to be aimed and uh, people are coming back to the university, we should note that in this new uh, norm, how and in what way we should proceed. So we have invited a very uh, distinguished uh, speaker uh, in this forum. Uh, our first speaker uh, is Prof. R. Hui Meng from uh, International Medical University. Second speaker, Robert uh, Kurndav from Elsevier. And third speaker is Scott Grillo from McGraw Hills. Uh, let us now, now first uh, introduce the first speaker, Prof. R. Hui Meng. Prof. R. Hui Meng is the Dean of Teaching Learning at IMU. She obtained her PhD in Science from University of Sydney and postgraduate certificate in medical education from the University of Dundee. As a Dean of Teaching Learning IMU, uh, she has been the uh, main leader in uh, curriculum design, development, implementation of health profession program. She chairs the teaching learning committee in the university and uh, guides all the associate deans of different program and uh, work closely with the academic programs to develop policies, guidelines for teaching learning assessment, overseeing the implementation and uh, quality assurance. I invite uh, Prof. R. Uh, and uh, uh, and the, the, and start with your deliberation. Thank you. Thanks, Prof. Nivesh. Um, can I share my screen? Yeah, please proceed, Prof. Okay. All right. Okay, you can see my screen, right? Yes, Prof. All right. Good morning, and thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak at this uh, prestigious event. Today, I'd like to share my perspectives on health professions education in the new norm. In 2010, the Global Independent Commission on Education of Health Professionals for the 21st century was established. They were given the task to identify the key professional competencies and recommend educational institutional reforms to develop a healthcare workforce to lead the health advances of the new century. The outcomes pointed out that a robust, competent and professionally capable workforce is required to handle new health threats and disease patterns, population movements and technological advances. A high quality workforce with inbuilt leadership at all levels is needed to drive health system innovations. At the same time, the world is becoming more interdependent and hence health professionals who are equipped with cross-cultural tools and sensitivities to be effective domestically and internationally are essential. In the past 10 years, a number of new educational approaches have been introduced in health professions education, and these include competency-based skills development, IT-based and distance learning, interprofessional and team-based learning, and modalities to link research and education from classroom to field practice. Besides, new global collaborative arrangements were formed. I'm sure many of you who are training health professionals can identify these newer approaches in your curricula, 
even before the outbreak of COVID-19 pandemic in 2020. Perhaps the process was smoother in some cases, but slow in others due to certain challenges or barriers, one of them being faculty resistance. Schwab, who is the founder of the World Economic Forum, together with Mallory, launched the book titled COVID-19, The Great Reset in July 2020. The pandemic presented unprecedented challenges to the global, social, economic, and political systems. The impacts are long-term, and it is almost impossible to go back to the pre-pandemic way of life after this. The pandemic has forced greater collaboration and cooperation within and between countries, and there are changes on individual perceptions and priorities as a result of greater awareness of social and inequalities issues climate change, and environmental problems. The pandemic offers a window of opportunities for new and better future, but changes are required to create a more inclusive, resilient, and sustainable world going forward. Interestingly, most of these discussion and views are also applicable to education, which is the foundation for social economic systems in any countries. At the start of the pandemic, we adapted quickly, learned from the experiences and mistakes. We continue to reflect and improve in order to enhance the educational outcomes and student experience. The pandemic is the source of disruption to education and has catalyzed the transformation of education in many ways, with the most significant being the human mindset change. Because of this, the impossibles that were previously barriers to the education transformation became possible within a short time. Riding on this, I think we are more than ever ready for a new norm in education. And I like to discuss this from the aspects of learning space, teaching and learning modalities, assessment and graduate skills and competencies. Without going into the details, I'm sure you still remember what was learning like in the university before the COVID-19 outbreak. We had on-campus and outside campus teaching and learning activities, mostly happening at times and venues prescribed by the university. The list here includes the common TNL activities, but they are not exclusive. Generally, students came to campus to attend lectures, tutorials, problem-based learnings, others for theory components. Meanwhile, they learned and practiced the psychomotor skills through workshops, lab practicals, and clinical skills sessions. Most of the assessments except assignment, which are usually take home, were conducted in the campus. In their senior years, they undertook internship, industrial attachment, and posting to gain exposure to real work environments where they apply their knowledge and skills to solve real life problems under the supervision of the preceptors. Besides, students also spend time on independent learning at home or other places outside campus. And most universities had learning management systems at different levels of maturity, which served as a repository of course information, some learning materials and resources, but the use was mainly supplementary to students' learning. The pandemic outbreak in early 2020 has forced educators to embark on innovative teaching and learning solutions to ensure continuity of education within a short period of time. In doing so, learners' equity has always been a critical consideration in the decision of the teaching and learning solutions this included the access to internet and resources, time zone differences, quarantine restrictions, and international border closure that affect different groups of students to different extents. Technology plays an important role in creating the viable solutions. Everyone, including faculty and students, has to adapt to remote online and teaching, uh, teaching and learning. Access to online learning resources was made flexible at any time from anywhere. A mixture of synchronous and asynchronous online sessions were arranged 
to enable students to attend the sessions at times convenient to them based on their preferences. It was also important to ensure that the students gain access to academic help and advice online. We struggled at the beginning, but became better as we went through the transition. What we did then were considered emergency online teaching. Some of them were quick fix solutions arising due to needs and urgency of the situations at the time. However, educators are also conscious that not everything can be taught and learned online. Distributed learning sites and remote learning could affect the quality and effectiveness of learning if not planned carefully. The isolation due to reduced interaction with faculty and peers can lead to lack of engagement and motivation, and in some cases, mental health issues. The different levels of IT skills among the faculty and students need to be addressed to ensure that learning is not compromised while we try to catch up with the newer apps and softwares from time to time. In the excitement of what technology can do to offer better learning experience, we should not lose sight on the educational principles in our approaches to design and implementation of online teaching and learning. Pedagogically effective online teaching that is well-designed and well-planned is required to meet the needs of the learners as well as the employers. This is why it's so important that educators work closely with the technologies to co-create improved solutions and products for online teaching and learning. The Skills for Health did a survey among about 2,400 health workers in UK in August 2020 to find out what they perceived as the key skills for health workers post-pandemic. While it's, a, it's obvious that the professional's knowledge and skills are very important, such as appropriate use of equipments and facilities, as well as infection prevention and control, the other skills that are high on the list are digital skills, that is the ability to operate online platforms, conveying information effectively, and dealing with out of the ordinary situations. Top skills related to resilience and cultural change include awareness of changing client and patient needs, managing own and others' uncertainty, active listening and understanding of others' reactions. They foresee that beyond COVID-19, Leadership development is extremely important and it's imperative to create a positive workplace culture. Attention should be given to protection against new cybersecurity risks. These are just to name a few. What we can infer from the survey findings is that we need to provide an authentic learning experience to our students involving real world problems for students to develop the required competencies. While ideally this should be happening in real work environments, the possibility of short-term and long-term interruption in access to healthcare facilities implies that simulation training needs to be enhanced to provide the true to life learning environment. We should continue to emphasize patient and client centeredness, ethics and professionalism and leadership in the curriculum. Digital competencies are essential to equip graduates with the skills for telemedicine and at the same time being cognizant of cybersecurity risks. Students should be trained using real world examples on principal decision making and crisis communication. Adaptability and resilience are crucial in making sure that they survive and excel in an increasingly uncertain environment. In order to make sure that the graduates are professionally competent while providing them with a personalized experience in their learning journey, the use of diverse teaching and learning modalities are recommended. Face-to-face -face teaching and learning sessions are still necessary to provide the in-person interaction essential for sense of belonging, rapport and trust building, as well as acquisition of physical and procedural skills. Online teaching continues where possible for cognitive development. 
Moving forward, hybrid classroom which provides the options of physical and virtual attendance is necessary. The technology allows the attendees who are present physically in the classroom to interact effectively with the virtual attendees. In this picture that was taken in November 2018, uh, it shows the holographic lecture that was held at the Imperial College Business School, whereby the speakers from different locations, these two in the middle, who were one of them were in, uh, was in Los Angeles, the other one in San Francisco, they were projected into the learning space while the other two speakers uh, were on site. The experience was so real that enabled the speakers and audience to interact and engage. They could take questions from the audience and respond. And at the same time, it gave the audience a very real experience on site, despite the physical separation. Perhaps the cost of conducting a holographic lecture will be more feasible in the near future with economies of scale. One of the advantages is that it will help to reduce long distance traveling and hence carbon footprints. Experiential learning in the simulation and workplace environments remain relevant in the new norm and perhaps deserve even higher attention in view of the need for authentic learning experiences. Advances in immersive technologies, such as the use of augmented reality and virtual reality are increasingly uh, used to increase engagement and students' understanding in a controlled environment before the students are sent out to the real work environment. Now with more inter-institutional collaboration than ever, sharing of learning resources will be the way to go to enhance cost and operational efficiency. With the use of artificial intelligence, we can shift from a one-size-fits-all educational approach to personalized learning approach. This is aligned with the concept of self-regulated learning by empowering the learners to take control of their learning and set their own goals. Using learning analytics, teaching and learning can be customized for each student based on his or her strengths, needs, skills, pace of learning, and interests. Early identification of students at risk with specific and targeted intervention and support will help to improve student experience and learning outcomes. Assessment practices will also shift in the new norm. The Joint Information Systems Committee, which is an organization that provides digital solutions for UK education and research, published a report on the future of assessment, five principles, five targets for 2025. The principles include authentic, accessible, appropriate automation, continuous, and security. Assessments should be authentic to prepare students for their future practice. Assessments should be accessible to students, including those at remote learning sites. Considerations and reasonable adjustment should be made for learners with disabilities. Appropriate automation should be adopted, especially for marking, so that timely and actionable feedback can be provided to the learners. There should be more continuous assessments to prepare students for lifelong learning, rather than placing emphasis on succeeding at one high stakes and high stress exams. Last but not least, the security of assessments to ensure the student taking the assessment is the correct student, the right student, and the work submitted is the genuine effort of the student is crucial. These above principles and targets are, uh, are aligned with the system's approach to assessments as recommended in the 2018 Ottawa Consensus Framework for Good Assessment, with recommendations to have more formative assessments, workplace-based assessment, using electronic portfolios, and programmatic assessment approaches. Newer assessment formats such as open book exams, online OSCE with virtual patients, assessments using high fidelity mannequins, structured video and viral exams are already being implemented 
and their validity and reliability can be demonstrated using the programmatic assessment approach. The availability of electronic record system and data analytics support the shift from time-based assessment to assessment on demand as and when the learners are ready. This is one of the principles of competency-based education. I'd like to end my talk with this slide taken from the internet. It's actually a marketing infographic for student recruitment in higher education, but the information is also applicable to education delivery. It's, it illustrates the preferences of Gen Z learners who are those born after 1995. These are the students in universities currently. They favor user-generated content, expect an immersive educational experience using personalized approach. Therefore, the way we deliver education has to change in order to meet the needs of the new generation of learners. These are my references. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Profar, for the comprehensive talk. Uh, if we summarize, Profar has started with uh, uh, teaching learning modalities, which we should change in the new norm. Along with the technological advances, uh, we should proceed with. And what are the precautions we should take implementing it? And last but not the least, uh, there are a lot of debate nowadays on open and closed book assessment in the new system. Uh, Profar has also commented on it. Uh, there are two other speakers, so uh, please uh, put your questions in the chat box. Uh, as Profar has already mentioned that uh, we educator uh, should work hand in hand with the technologist so that uh, the new norm can be successful in uh, teaching learning of a new generation of the students uh, in the new platform. Our next speaker is uh, Robert uh, Kanduff from Elsevier Publications. Uh, Rod Robert Kanduff is Chief Operation Officer at 3D4 Medical from Elsevier. Uh, his main responsibility is for content and uh, integration opportunities. And uh, for your information, 3D4 Medical provides world's most advanced 3D anatomy platform with a flagship product, Complete Anatomy. In the last five years, uh, Robert has spoken at multiple educational uh, platform. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we, we could not uh, receive Robert in LRF uh, directly. Uh, we have actually recorded a version of presentation, but uh, Ms. Natasha Gulati from Elsevier would represent Robert uh, during question answer session. Now I will uh, request uh, LRF team to continue with Robert's presentation. Uh, hi there, my name is Robert Kerndoff. I'm the Director of Innovation for Global Medical Education here at Elsevier. And uh, I'd like to talk to you today about the evolution of immersive medical education. And can I just say how uh, delighted I was to be asked to speak uh, at the IMU Learning Resource Festival. Uh, it, it's a real honor. And, uh, and um, I hope you find this uh, talk interesting and informative. Um, I, I've been involved in medical uh, or digital medical education for over 25 years now. Uh, back in 1997, I started with an e learning company that was creating uh, um, uh, e-learning for drug launches, uh, mainly in the US. Uh, it was for training pharmaceutical sales reps about mechanism of action, uh, the disease states that uh, this drug was going to affect, et cetera, et cetera. One of the things that we noticed uh, um, when, when teaching these pharmaceutical sales reps was that it was the 3D content that was in videos, the 3D anatomical content that really grabbed their attention. It was extremely engaging. And this is important. Uh, uh, and this is something that we stuck to and uh, uh, came back to. So let's dial forward a number of years. Uh, and um, the CEO of that company was a man called John Moore, uh, who went on to found 3D for Medical. And 3D for Medical was a, 
a company that sold images and it sold it rights managed and stock images based around the 3D anatomical models uh, um, captured realistically and stylized. Uh, and with huge bank of, of you know, 30, 40,000 images that would sell through Getty Corbus and a, a number of other uh, uh, image sites. And that was very successful. Uh, um, but then came the downturn around 2007, 2008, and it was really 2008 it would hit us. And then uh, uh, John did something very clever. He, he pivoted towards this new platform that had been created uh, uh, to feed into the iPhone that was uh, had been released a year or two earlier. And that was the App Store. Uh, and it was largely misunderstood uh, um, how this would work. Uh, I remember at the time, it was there was no real clear vision of how this App Store would work, certainly among, not amongst the general public. But John saw it as a perfect platform to be able to create content and sell content, software content that is, on globally. So we created a product called the Skeleton System. Uh, um, and this was a reference product for medical students. We had a medically accurate skeleton, so it wasn't a huge leap to create this product. We had to label it and we had to come up with a way to mimic the 3D environment. Because we realized at the time, the render engines that were out there could not do justice to the graphics. They would always be a little too boxy uh, uh, and low quality. Um, so we developed something where you had 36 images, uh, 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 one after another, to, for each rotation. Uh, and in that way, we were able to mimic a 3D environment, but using high quality 2D images. Uh, this proved to be very successful. Uh, um, and we went on to create a number of, of different applications, both for uh, medical students and for medical professionals. Uh, and then we realized, no, we had to move to the next level. We had to create that real 3D environment. So we had to create our own render engine, which we did. Uh, it took us a while, a lot of money, but we did. Because one of the things we could not lose was the quality of the imagery. It had to remain the same. We couldn't take a step backwards where all our competitors were using games engines. We had to stay with the same quality, which we did, and it became very successful. Um, the launch of the iPad is, was real rocket fuel to what we were doing. The iPhone apps were successful and greatly used as, as reference tools, but the iPad with its larger screen size was perfect for education. And um, in fact, and Apple realized this. They also realized we were selling an awful lot of um, iPads. So luckily, they came involved and they started including us in a lot of their advertising campaigns. Uh, also, we appeared quite a number of times on stage. This particular time here, was at the launch of the iPad Pro. We were on stage with um, Adobe Photoshop uh, and uh, they showed their product and then we showed ours and how it would work on the iPad Pro and how the extra processing power could create this wonderful product that is so useful for medical students and medical professionals. Uh, and that's a real boost to have that shown to 40 million people around the world. Uh, uh, it really, really helped. So back now to why these, this, this, what I would like to call uh, 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 an extra reality. That is the 3D uh, uh, product on a 2D screen. Now, I understand most of you will say, no, that's not extra reality. But I think it's at least the godfather of extra reality because you're putting something on a 2D screen that you can immerse yourself in. You can go around, you can look at it from any point you like. And I'll show you what that looks like in a second, but here's the need for it. So in the past, if you're looking for a, uh, uh, as a medical student, you're learning anatomy, you're learning about, let's say, in this particular moment, the levator scapula muscle. You see it on the left here in a 2D image, netter image, and you can see where it passes. It's in the neck, it goes underneath certain muscles, beside certain muscles. Okay, I can see that. I'd have to go somewhere else to find out where its origin and insertion points were. And I'd have to use, for example, either, if I want to contextualize it against other muscles, I would have to use anatomical slices or MRI scans, uh, like the one on the right here, to understand a list of those going up and down the, the neck to, to understand uh, uh, how it reacts or how it sits in relation to other muscles uh, 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 along the neck. Now, of course, you would have cadaveric dissections, 
uh, to do the same thing, but you have very limited time uh, with the cadaver. And even then you can't pull it apart. It is either pre-dissected or you're dissecting to a particular uh, um, aim. You can't just choose to check out a particular muscle yourself. So it, it, while it was a resource, it wasn't a great resource for what you needed on a regular basis. Then along came our product. Now let's choose the same muscle. So we go in, we choose uh, either by the search tool or directly on the muscle, on the model, the levator scapulae muscle. We can isolate it. So you'd see exactly where it sits, its insertion points and origin point. Uh, and you can then see what it's like in the actual articulation itself, the movement. And you can fade down the muscle to see exactly how it helps in that particular movement. You can then go to uh, why that movement happened, the innervation. You can see the path of the nerves that go from the, uh, uh, the spinal column down to that particular muscle. And you can do the same with the blood supply. If you go up now, we can choose uh, uh, the arteries and you can see exactly which artery, where it comes from and how it supplies that uh, muscle. And of course the beating heart for uh, extra engagement value. So as you can see, this is a, a whole different way of understanding uh, um, uh, anatomy and being able to directly go to the pieces of knowledge you want to understand in that 3D model. Uh, and that was revolutionary. Now, it, it, was, um, it was revolutionary for students because in our B2C market, we had no problems. Students understood the value immediately. They understood the increase in, in cognition rates, the increase in retention rates, uh, because they saw it firsthand and they passed it on by word of mouth. Institutions were a little slower. We needed um, um, a bit more validation. Uh, and these are some of the very early studies that helped with that, either by calling out one of our products in particular or the uh, value of 3D uh, in general. Uh, then along came um, AR. So what was next? The beginnings of the extra realities. And the first that came along was AR, augmented reality. And uh, that appeared in a lot of the devices that uh, our platform was on, the iPhone, the iPad, uh, and, and eventually on some of the Android uh, products. As soon as it became available, we included it. Uh, now, does it have any real pedagogical value? No, I don't think so. But um, does it have engagement value? Absolutely. For example, sales reps would often uh, um, uh, uh, use AR and engaging whoever they were talking to. Anytime I was asked, I'll just play this movie here. Anytime I was asked what I did for a living, I'd always pull out my iPhone and go to the heart beating and I'd put it in the middle of a, in an AR mode in the middle of the dining table. So people would look around it or explode it out. So you saw the, the beating parts in unison. That was always the wow factor. Uh, and it was extremely engaging, but that's the point. How do we go from that wow factor to the next stage. Uh, um, and that's the real challenge for all of XR, to move beyond that wow uh, factor. That being said, we are seeing some useful and interesting use cases emerging for both MR and VR, the next things, mixed reality and virtual reality. Let's take a quick look at a product. This is the product we created in conjunction with uh, Pearson and Microsoft. As you can see, it used the same anatomical models as our main platform, while I'm offering that immersive experience. Uh, now the pandemic escalated demand for all remote learning, and we began to be presented with interesting use cases that greatly enhanced distance learning. Distance learning. Experiments we were being conducted with Holohuman as part of a number of different remote learning solutions, from surgical training to clinical rounds. However, one of the most exciting use cases for all XR and medical training, I think, is its ability to create the closest thing to clinical practice there is. Wearing a headset and being immersed, albeit in a virtual situation, still brings with it a sense of jeopardy, the quickening of the heart rate, the sense of controlled panic that is hard to mimic outside of virtual reality. <clears throat> uh, 
On our nursing education side of Elsevier, we are developing some VR capabilities, as you'll see here. This is a, a, a VR product, uh, and it's what uh, we're calling uh, the Virtual Reality Simulation Learning System. And this product has a large number of scenarios that can be played out within a virtual environment, whilst you're monitored and controlled by a facilitator. And this is where I see some of the most exciting use cases for all VR or all XR in medical training. That ability to create the closest thing to clinical practice there is, wearing a headset and being immersed in a virtual situation uh, uh, really helps in, in, in bridging that gap between education and clinical practice. So XR is finding some real use cases, which is great. And, the, and this bodes well for being taken seriously, not just the PR exercise by deans. Um, <clears throat> There are a number of catalysts that are driving XR adoption, and these have really been um, uh, highlighted as a result of COVID. Uh, for example, um, remote learning is now part of many uh, uh, institutions' uh, blended solution to medical learning, uh, uh, and especially in some of the Nordic countries, it is being used more and more as part of a blended solution. The second is the scalability that extra realities allow you. Uh, um, <clears throat> it, it came first, it came out because of COVID, you were, only, you, were only, you were only allowed a certain number of people in a room at the same time. The rest had to be on extra realities looking in, whether it's virtual reality or mixed reality. But at that same time, you can have any number of people watching in. There was no limit to the amount of people that you could have attending remotely. And the third, of course, is the effect of Moore's law on any software or hardware for that matter. Uh, and with devices becoming cheaper and more powerful, the educational value increases. And that was one of the key barriers to adoption. Um, it go back to when we had our launched our complete anatomy platform. We had no problem with students, as I said before, but we did have a problem with institutions. And one of those problems was, how can we introduce a, a software that has limited access. Uh, in other words, not everyone in the classroom has a smart device, uh, be it a smartphone or later a tablet, uh, iPad, whatever, to be able to view the digital product. Therefore, it's unfair if we introduce it. <clears throat> or we have to pay for those devices to go into those uh, um, uh, schools, uh, be it the university does or the supplier does. Um, however, these things change very quickly. I imagine only one generation of devices we bought. And by the time it comes to the next generation, 99% of the, of the uh, students will have some form of XR product that they use on a regular basis. Uh, it's the same thing has happened with uh, iPads, etc., And the same thing will most likely happen with XR realities. It's moving fast. It's moving very fast. Uh, uh, it, every every new technology moves that a little bit faster than one before, and so we will see these uh, uh, devices becoming more and more prolific. However, as it matures, we're going to have to continue to find more and more exciting use cases until we come upon that killer use case for XR. It's out there and it'll happen. We just don't know exactly what it is yet. I think it's the immersion and the jeopardy factor. But that might not be it. It might be something else. We just got to have wait and see. So thank you very much, and I hope this has been uh, somewhat informative. And um, thank you. Goodbye. Thank you, uh, Robert Kandav and uh, Elsevier for this presentation. Uh, remember, uh, Prof. Arui Meng, previous speaker, has already mentioned that. Uh, Adaptation to personalized learning is one of the important aspect of uh, this uh, new norm. And IMU has invested a lot on this uh, development of asynchronous learning. Uh, in the field of anatomy, as you have seen, there are a lot of progress in uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, and 3D reconstruction. So in the new medical curriculum, the anatomy lectures are very, very less. Lecturers are producing micro learning videos and the students in their laptop, they have complete anatomy. So that uh, this a blend of uh, uh, the lecturer's input as well as 
the asynchronous learning uh, with the help of Elsevier, uh, we are actually adapting to the new norm. Our next speaker is from another part of digital transformation uh, from the publication aspect. Uh, Scott Grillo is from McGraw Hill and Scott Grillo uh, was president of McGraw Hill's professional group from March 2018. And uh, he is responsible for all aspects of uh, McGraw Hill's publication program, uh, particularly online subscription product in medical, technical, business, and test prep categories. Uh, Scott led the digital transformation of uh, Magro Hill in uh, platform development, product launches, technology innovation, and even digital delivery, including the portfolio expansion of Magro Hill. Um, out of its uh, many contribution, uh, he is also uh, representing uh, American publishers, uh, professional and scholarly division. I will now request uh, uh, LRF team to uh, start presentation, recorded presentation of Scott Grillo. My name is Scott Grillo. I'm the president of McGraw-Hill Professional. And I'd like to thank you all for inviting me to join you here, uh, at least virtually, to discuss this important topic and to share with you why we at McGraw-Hill care so very deeply about this and how we see our role in empowering medical educators to train the doctors of the future, given the ever-changing landscape of medicine and the demanding contemporary student learning needs. Now, I'm sure the burning question on everybody's mind, I'm sure the question of this session for the last few days has been, what does the future hold? If we could predict the future, it would certainly be much easier to make plans. Well, I'm sure some of you have recently learned of your university's plan for the fall. Many others are awaiting a final announcement, which means the faculty have to be ready to teach in a variety of different options, perhaps on a somewhat short notice. This past spring, the focus was really to simply get courses up and online quickly and to keep the momentum for student learning, which everyone did with really impressive speed. But perhaps even in your own mind, the quality wasn't quite up to the caliber that you're used to. This fall, student expectations are likely going to be a little bit higher since we've all had some time to plan for contingencies and make improvements in our online courses, should we need to deliver them in that format once again. In general, my sense is that if this COVID disruption is going to accelerate changes to curricula, to teaching styles, to learning methods that were already well underway, even pre-shutdown. Well, for others, it's going to present entirely new challenges and require wholesale changes in some cases to the educational ecosystem. So in this presentation, I'm going to share with you some insights and some tools to help you meet those challenges uh, and how we would really like to continue partnering with you uh, to meet those challenges as well. So before I begin, let me just make very clear that this is a publisher's perspective. This is how we at McGraw Hill see the changing needs of our customers. This is how we see some of these changes affecting medical schools. But most importantly, I'd like you to walk away from this presentation understanding that what's most important to us is understanding how we can partner with you better to help meet some of those challenges and to keep moving the educational ecosystem moving forward. To understand our path forward and how we're preparing to help you as instructors and educators in this time of great uncertainty, I think it's useful to take a quick look backwards at our evolution as a digital content and a digital solutions provider. You know, our journey with electronic publishing really began a little over 20 years ago with the launch of Harrison's Online. And in many ways, we were just following a path that had blazed for us by the journals, which had been at that point providing electronic information on DVDs and online for, for quite some time. So we were really just listening to our customers who were saying that the type of reference content that we were providing, they would much prefer to have online. So for the first few years of our endeavor, our mission was really just simply to try to get as much of our content online as quickly as possible. It didn't have anything to do with thinking about educational systems, teaching needs, student learning behaviors. It was simply get content online as quickly as possible. As our po product portfolio grew, however, 
and our usage of medical schools grew, we started to pay more attention to the changes that were happening in the medical education. We started to spend more time thinking about how our content and our solutions could really help. And what we saw was a very interesting and evolving learning path, moving from a traditional model, traditional model of learning that was very passive, in some ways one-dimensional, to an integrated blend of self-directed learning and live instruction where students are constantly doing and practicing, learning and practicing. What did that mean? What do we start to see? Before class, students would gain exposure to the material via videos, readings, case materials. They'd spend a lot of time on self-assessment, formative and summative. At the start of class, students would work together in teams to complete quizzes or assignments and to really ensure their preparation for that day's lessons. And in class, faculty was guiding their learning, answering questions, posing different suggestions, and students were collaborating to practice and apply the material that was being presented. So what did these changes mean? For us as content developers and product developers, this evolution in how students were learning and engaging with our content and our products, even pre-COVID, meant that we had to think differently about those products in our content. And most importantly, our interactions and our relationships with you as instructors needed to get stronger. And given the uncertainty that COVID has introduced to the entire ecosystem, this partnership has grown even more important. We'd like to continue to understand how can we partner more effectively with instructors to ensure that our content is meeting your needs as well as the needs of your students? How can our products support emerging teaching methodologies and continue to play a meaningful role in educating future clinicians? How can we leverage technology in the best way to enrich and enliven the core content without ever giving up on the quality and the rigor of the medical knowledge our resources have always been known for? Over the past few years, we've spent a lot of time on campuses around the world, listening to students and residents, observing classes, attending rounds, talking with faculty and deans to help us sharpen our understanding of where the medical education market is going. And in the rest of this presentation, I'd like to share with you some of our findings and more importantly, how we're making changes to our product portfolio to address those changes. Now, right around the same time that we started our journey of discovery and how we could better embed ourselves into the educational ecosystem, a really important article uh, by Ronald Harden was published called The 10 Key Features of the Future of Medical School, Not an Impossible Dream. And in that paper, the authors posed a really interesting idea, which was that the fundamental difference in medical school of the future will be moving from a just-in-case learning model to a just-in-time learning model. The paper identified that the information and cognitive overload students were facing as a result of too much emphasis being placed on the student or trainee trying to memorize all that they need to know while the proliferation of medical knowledge was only accelerating was simply not sustainable. Now, I'm sure a lot of the statistics that are on this slide are well known to many of you. At that time, the authors called out that there were more than 60,000 possible diagnoses, more than 6,000 interventions, and that the medical knowledge was doubling every 18 months or less, and that there was simply no way for a student or a trainee to keep up. The authors did say, however, that a mastery of the vocabulary of medicine, the core knowledge, the threshold concepts, and the possibilities in medicine will always be important but knowing that students and trainees can't possibly memorize everything that they'll need to know over the course of a very long career, that there was really a growing importance in training clinicians to efficiently and effectively manage information gaps when they come across something that they don't know. That is teaching clinicians how to ask the right questions, how to know where to look for answers, and perhaps more importantly, how to evaluate the answers that they receive. One of the conclusions of the paper was that the ability to ask the right questions was perhaps one of the most important things that medical educators needed to spend more time on. 
The author stated that the medical school of the future will see a switch from the teacher as an information provider to one of an information coach where the student is supported in finding information when they require it. That paper really prompted a lot of thinking about the way our digital transformation was unfolding and served as a foundation for observations and conversations that we would have on campus over the next few years. You know, as a publisher of reference and foundational medical knowledge, this idea now that students weren't simply going to sit down and read from page one to page 2000 and absorb all of that information, but needed to find different ways to engage with it and different ways to be able to find information, sort information, and validate the quality of the information had a lot of really interesting dynamics for us as an information services provider. Now, as we started to fan out across medical schools uh, to really try to understand uh, this evolution and this emerging model that was starting to, to take hold, um, at the time, this was a scene that we really saw just about everywhere. I'm sure it's a, a scene that's very familiar to most of you. A large lecture hall with students gathered to listen to an instructor present them with information. The model was very much teacher-centric. It was very passive. Before class, students were expected to have done some sort of reading to prepare for the class. In class, the faculty lectured, the students listened. You know, the model became known as the sage on the stage. And after class, the faculty was not always as available. Students did their homework individually to try to practice and apply the material that they were presented to in, in lecture. However, even though many medical schools were still following this traditional model, now, the undercurrents of change were, were obvious. There was a real shift of student learning styles towards the higher education type of behavior or the TPAC model. Many of the admissions tests, such as the MCAT, were now starting to emphasize not only what students know, but how well they use or apply what they know. There continued to be this problem with the overwhelming amount of information coming out, some of it not always from very quality sources, and a shift in students who wanted constant feedback on their performance so that they can improve almost right away. All of which was putting a lot of pressure on faculty to change their teaching strategies and incorporate less traditional methodologies to more engaging, more two-directional, such as the flipped classroom, guided discovery learning, problem-based learning, etc. So today, when we visit medical schools and spend time in classes or in case-based learning environments to try to really continue to understand this dynamic, this is very much what we see. Large lecture halls have been replaced by small groups of students with a faculty facilitator going through a clinical case with a scenario that's been designed to stimulate interest and promote the application of principles. The model is very much student-centered the problem that the students are given is open and encourages discussion. Students generate learning issues and research those concepts from a variety of sources. And then they reconvene to discuss their findings and together to actively solve the problem. And perhaps most importantly, educators have gone from a sage on the stage to what they now refer to as the guide on the side. Now, there were two important observations that we made during this. One, with the, this change was very much global. This scene that you're seeing here on the slide could be happening in just about any medical school around the world. The second observation was that the smart use of embedded technology in our learning resources and teaching resources could really help facilitate this transformation and help not only students, but faculty to be more successful. And what this change meant as far as course delivery was that course delivery options were suddenly now much more flexible. We could have blended learning, which included flipped classrooms or modified flipped classrooms and high flex learning. Now, sometimes there's some ambiguity about the term blended learning, also known as hybrid learning, especially since there are so many different definitions and concepts. So just to make sure that we're all on the same page, or at least you're understanding our definition or how we think about the concept, I want to define what I'm referring to here. And, and the definition that we kind of fall back to comes from another paper from Garrison and Kanuka 
uh, that was published in 2004 in the Internet of Higher Education Journal. And there they really laid out that blended teaching and learning includes anywhere between 30 and 80 percent, I think about 80 percent of course content delivered online with some face-to-face -face interaction. Blended learning has become more of an umbrella term, which refers to teaching and learning strategies which combine in-person and online methodologies. And the interesting part of it is that they had some research to back up that this type of learning is popular because it's, again, much more student-centered. It has the potential to increase the interaction between students and teachers and make that interaction much more meaningful, leading to improved learning outcomes. Now, of course, this change didn't happen without some disruption. Right? There were changes that were going to happen with students that were going to both drive these changes and going to force changes in the students themselves. So what did we observe and learn about students and trainees as this transformation was go, uh, undertaken? First thing is that we saw that students very much wanted to engage with content. They wanted their content to be interactive. Perhaps that's a generational thing. Uh, perhaps that's just students recognizing that engaging in interactive content is a much more foundational way of learning and absorbing concepts. Students wanted instant feedback from their learning activities. No more were they satisfied with reading a chapter and taking a test at the end of the chapter. They wanted instant feedback to see how they were progressing. They very much craved high yield summaries of complex concepts, and they wanted case-based and real world examples that would allow them to apply right away what it was that they were learning. We saw an increase used in video in place of lectures to help reinforce that learning. And to me, the most interesting phenomenon during all of this was that students were starting to learn from test prep and Q&A. That is, test prep, Q&A, is becoming the preferred modality of, of learning. It wasn't just to test at the end of your learning how much you grasped and absorbed the concept. This was the preferred way of, of, of learning. And finally, they wanted audio and podcasts to fit in their increasingly mobile life. Now, along with challenges and, and, and different obstacles that this model was providing to students or presenting students, faculty were also under a lot of pressure to change the way that they had done things. And we saw that implementing a curriculum is, is not easy. You know, it takes a tremendous amount of time. It takes interaction and, and a strong partnership, often between the faculty and the librarian who is charged with sourcing the different types of resources. A lot of times there was a lack of consistency in the educational resources that students were using on their own. There was a need to involve teams of faculty for many hours. And a lot of times the information was, was out of date keeping up with the currency of medical education is becoming even, even more problematic. And even with well done tools, a lot of faculty struggle with this idea of facilitating in a case-based learning environment rather than being the expert. All of this was of course before the pandemic and the pandemic has just added to these challenges and, and changes that all of us need to adapt to. And perhaps the biggest change which COVID has presented all of us is uncertainty. Now, regardless of your aptitude or your comfort level with online or hybrid teaching, the reality is we all must deal with uncertainty these days. Universities are not going to be able to predetermine the type of course delivery due to the unforeseen recurrence of the virus. Faculty are going to need to prepare for different deliveries of their teaching style, whether it's face-to-face, -face, online synchronous, online asynchronous, and perhaps all three within the same term. And teaching outcomes are going to need to be the same. Students and the society as a general simply demands that this cohort of students is as well-educated and well-trained as the generations that came before them which means that teaching styles and materials need to be able to suit each of these three different types of teaching opportunities. However, we believe that there's a big difference between dealing with uncertainty and being prepared during uncertainty. And we believe that our role 
and helping you to be prepared during uncertainty is to provide you with high quality, authoritative content across different forms and medium to meet your needs as educators and the needs of your students and to be as flexible as perhaps you are going to have to be this fall. Thank you, McGraw-Hill. Uh, uh, the Scott Grillo's presentation was very, very comprehensive. Uh, he started with the distributed learning to real world experience. For participants' kind information, IMU as flag bearer of uh, private medical education in Malaysia has uh, spearheading this drive. In, in our new curriculum in uh, 2021, which is started from the very beginning in semester one, the students are starting with uh, team-based learning, problem-based learning, and case-based learning. And we have reduced the lecture drastically. I can just give you an example. Before starting the LRF today at eight o'clock, I just facilitated with my other uh, colleagues from different discipline in cardiorespiratory course. They, after the initial few deliberation, the students proceeded with a team-based learning on acute respiratory distress syndrome. And uh, they started with anatomy of the respiratory tract then uh, physiology of hypoxia related changes in ARDS in uh, the functioning and then pathology and microbiology. So uh, uh, when, when I was facilitating and it's a huge task, we have got 200 students and nearly 16, 17 groups. So we require almost 10 faculty simultaneously to facilitate. However, when you look at the students engagement, it is uh, tremendous. Now I will request uh, Prof. Aruhi Meng, uh, Ms. Natasha Gulati from Elsevier, and Mr. Kevin Ong uh, from uh, McGraw Hill uh, to uh, start the panel discussion. Uh, we have uh, no questions. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and uh, uh, we have uh, no questions still now in the chat, but uh, I will just, as the new norm in education is a very hot topic and uh, we, we from the panel uh, and before a discussion, we came through few burning topics. One, one of the topic already has been highlighted by partly by Prof. Arumi Meng about um, whatever the universities are doing in a new norm. Uh, the question is end users or learners, uh, are they uh, included in this drive or are they being excluded? Um, definitely, we have to include the students because we need to know what is their preference and what suits their needs. And besides the students, I think we also need to include the employers, the other stakeholders. So the all parties will have to work hand in hand to understand how to meet the needs of the, of the uh, future employment um, as well as the learners. I think the learners are our, you know, like main customers in education. So we need to make sure that they are prepared, they are, they are equipped with the competencies that are um, uh, required by the employers. Yeah. Uh, I want also uh, some, uh, some input from Ms. Natasha. I remember that when uh, this uh, pandemic started uh, near about uh, September, October, Natasha came forward and uh, organized uh, a workshop with the students of our clinical faculty and students in uh, Seremban. <clears throat> so Natasha, uh, what is your uh, feedback about uh, the, the students being stakeholder? I, I think it's very, very important. At Elsevier, we are firmly of the opinion that it's very important to involve students from day one, not just in the education, but for example, Elsevier is very focused on developing products for education. So when we create our products, be it complete anatomy or be a clinical key student, we always take feedback from students. A lot of our development is dependent on the feedback that we receive from students as well as from faculty, we have created councils of students and faculty from all over the world who give us feedback on the products. And even in our products, there is the option to give live feedback. So at any point, uh, if the student feels that there is more to discuss 
about a certain piece of content, be it a book chapter or a question, they can just click a button and send product feedback back, right back to our product team so that we can incorporate that feedback in the shortest amount of time. So going forward, we believe that students will be the ones in power. In fact, we're looking at a future where students will be so empowered, especially now that everything is online, all classes are available online, students will be in a position to make a decision which faculty, which course, which university they want to ascribe to. And then we will be serving the students at the end of the day. So that's our vision of the future. And therefore, students are a very important stakeholder in this entire ecosystem, right next to faculty up there. Uh, uh, thank you, thank you, you, Natasha. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I, I just want uh, Profar to explain that uh, as a, uh, uh, a very important uh, uh, leader in IMU, can you just tell us about what are the processes in IMU regarding involving the learner in the uh, decision making process? Right. Um, I think for all the uh, um, past years, uh, we have always have uh, students representatives in the curriculum and assessment committees for all programs. So their voices are heard to make sure that they are the ones who um, get the feedback from the class and convey that uh, to the um, teaching team. And not only that, the communication is actually two-way, right? So if there's any decision about the um, uh, for example, changing in teaching learning assessment activities um, that are coming from the faculty side that their opinions and the views all, uh, from the students are also sought and because they are also a member of that formal committee. So to, to make them a, um, a, a member of these committees is important to make sure that they have equal, sort of like equal power in the decision making. So that's the very first thing that we had all these years um, besides the uh, curriculum and assessment committees, we also have um, the student representative council and they are also invited to uh, various um, quality assurance um, uh, committees at the university level. So I think we make sure that um, they are, the student bodies are well represented uh, at all levels. Uh, thank you, Profar. Uh, now the second question, which is collected uh, from us, uh, this particularly came for clinical students that uh, they feel that the clinical clerkship and clinical training have been compromised uh, to a large extent during this uh, new norm. Uh, I want uh, feedback from Kevin first. Yeah, so thank you for that question. I think it's definitely the right question to ask. I think when it comes to clinical, you know, when COVID happens, a lot of, you know, students are unable to go to the hospitals to really go to their roundings. And I think one of the, you know, what we have been doing to support the institutions is we partner with schools to actually seize what are the videos that we have. You know, you know, there's a lot of videos that we have in the video learning sector. Uh, a lot of them are videos are, some are really, you know, communication with patients. How do you interact with patients? How do you probe? These are unique soft skills that you, you, know, you would not get from the textbooks, right? So these are the things that you actually need to experience it. And through you know, video learning, we are able to do so uh, and really get a face-to-face -face interaction with them and you know, see facial response. I think that's important. Uh, apart from it itself, I think we also work a lot more in, in, in terms of other ways of learning, you know, not just on content learning. I, I know that a lot of, you know, uh, lecturers and students, uh, they always rely on, you know, from my growth here to provide authoritative, world-renowned content. But apart from that, we actually, on our access platform, we, pro we work with actually advisory board. And the advisory board is not from my growth here. It's actually from contributors like uh, doctors that is in training or teachers or even researchers in medical. They are really, you know, uh, at the heads of, you know, what they're facing now to feedback to us what is the required kind of gap that the people are facing now and what are the things that we can resolve it. So like podcasts, like video-based learning, like step-to-steps, uh, you know, kind of walk through and also, you know, using uh, in, the, in terms of 
uh, AR in terms of the kind of reality, in terms of the kind of information. This can really give a lot of uh, tools to teachers and students to learn on the go. All right, so that definitely uh, is definitely one of them. And just sorry to not to too much too much on the product. I would say that itself is I do uh, definitely things that in terms of online learning is definitely great. And I will say that you know we have seen uh, IMU have introduced a lot of this kind of intro, intro, uh, good learning way of styles during this difficult time. And we see the usage of SS medicine increase over what we have for the full year of last year. So tremendous results uh, that we are seeing the contribution for IMU moving towards this area, which is great. And you know, we definitely will be you know, working in hand in hand. How can we support IMU further from here to do in the future? Yeah, with response to Kevin, uh, we are, uh, particularly our clinical school has taken a massive effort from August uh, 2020. Initially, we had some shock, shock time and all. But uh, remember, uh, still now, uh, the research says that most of the students in Asia, this is actually recently published literature, 3348 students uh, actually uh, in, in this uh, study, 20% told that uh, e-learning uh, in clinical uh, application or clinical medicine, particularly for semester nine and 10, is still negligible. So uh, I want uh, Prof. first to comment about this. Well, I think first thing is that um, faculty need to catch up. You know, there's a lot of um, time and uh, effort that is required to actually develop all these e-learning materials. And one thing is the, uh, you know, readiness of the IT skills, the digital competencies to um, prepare or get, or even like uh, work with the, for example, the e-learning team to develop these materials. And the other thing is um, they are also at the same time uh, preparing their day-to-day -day kind of like teaching uh, um, activities. So, um, I think there are there are challenges, um, but the thing is like we are we are working towards that where we have more resources available in the e-learning team. Um, we have more multimedia designers to work with them, so that that will help to take away some of the uh, you know administrative burdens from the faculty, so that they can focus on what they are best at. That is the content development, but leaving the technology part um, to the, for example, the e-learning team to handle and both parties work uh, closely together. I think that is a more effective uh, and efficient way uh, to move forward. Uh, th thank you, Prof. Har. And now I will bring another important issue which uh, Prof. Har has actually mentioned during the presentation is equity of the students in, during the whole process. Uh, from March 2020, when this started, uh, how is uh, the, the students' cooperation along with the universities and uh, Ministry of Health? Uh, do you think that all, the, all our three panelists, do you think that uh, there is enough representation of the student during the whole process? That means when you are fighting the pandemic, both in education sector as well as in medical sector, are the students uh, truly involved? Uh, Kevin, to start? I think definitely, I think in terms of, you know, when a pandemic happens a lot, I think in different countries, different regions where, you know, where the increase in COVID patients is there, a lot of residents or even just graduated, um, you know, students are already involved in helping uh, with the COVID patients out there. I think this is really hands-on uh, kind of thing, the experience that you not get. And I would say that, you know, pandemic like this doesn't really happen or all, all in all, I think it's something very new. So it's you know something that we need to respond very fast. We need to work on very fast. So it's not something that is like you know three years ago we happen to have we have this situation and we can use. You know the, the closest we have is like SARS or MERS, but you know that is not as long stretch as what we are seeing with COVID. I think the the, the impact or the influence of COVID is definitely larger. I would say. So in terms of that itself, we you know uh, we. We see with in terms of working with the government itself, definitely can we can do more and then we can we can do do I think but the support is definitely there. So you know the support in terms of the resources, the teaching is still happening. And like 
Wei Ming mentioned, you know, uh, is you know the teachers. How can the teachers interact with students more to get it uh, to get more engaging? And I personally feel that you know from from many response of feedback I got is actually uh, that now teachers and students is not students are not coming to you know to learn just only for one hour in a lecture anymore. It's about how they can continuously continuous education learning, like what we mentioned. It's not something that you like, oh, today I need to go in for a lecture, today I just study anatomy and that's it. No, right? It's ongoing. What can we learn from the new things right? we are discovering day to day, right? COVID, like COVID response is something that we know uh, we, we have in SS and it's live updated as we go. Uh, and it's not something that you wait, need to wait for three years to get the, the content into access. So it's always ongoing. We have new updates. How do, can we respond to it? How do we treat it? What's the new finding about it? It's always new. So this is something, you know, very, very much uh, what we see is medical learning is definitely fresh. It's definitely, you know, moving very fast. I would say that this is very good in a way. And what, one thing that I actually see a lot of teachers, uh, they're engaging the students is actually through a lot of tools, like they can use WhatsApp, they can use Google Chat, they can use hypothesis that we support, that we work with, uh, that put content to have a discussion base. It's not just teachers teaching the students, but it's also students to interact with other students to share their knowledge about it. So this is, you know, the community we're talking about where I think teachers can create an ecosystem and things can go beyond. You know, when you see a video that is good, post it, and the next day moment, student can be discussing on it. So it's always interesting in terms of the new way of teaching. Uh, Natasha, what is, what is your experience with the IMU students? Well, sure. So Prof Nilesh, very, very interesting question and very pertinent topic. So thank you for raising that. I'd like to break down your question into two parts, equity and student involvement. Equity is one issue where the students have equal access and equal, uh, equal access to education, educational content. That I believe remains a challenge, especially in Asia Pacific. And to address that challenge, that's a responsibility of not just one university or faculty, that's the responsibility of the entire ecosystem of stakeholders. That includes people like Elsevier, who are the content and technology providers. It includes your telecom providers who need to make internet accessible. It includes the government who needs to create education and technology policy that will enable access in remote areas. So equity is one issue and it deserves a completely separate uh, conversation. The other part is involvement. So one thing that IMU does fabulously is to ensure student equity. As far as we are experienced with IMU is that IMU is at the top when it comes to adopting the right platforms, be it digital platforms or be it content or be it any kind of teaching methodologies. IMU is at the top of using the best world-class best practices available for their students. And conversely, even the students are extremely active. So as Prof Er also mentioned, they have student councils, which I have seen personally are extremely active. The student councils go beyond their curriculum to think about what can be impactful for their education, for their career development. So the student councils in IMU are extremely active. Students at IMU are extremely entrepreneurial. They are encouraged to try new things, be it in their education, be it in medicine, be it in business. They're extremely entrepreneurial. So I would say the involvement level of the students in IMU is extremely high. And great universities like IMU have been able to achieve that level of involvement for those students who have access. So if the student doesn't enjoy equity, there's no point of discussing involvement. But for IMU students, they do enjoy equity. And there we can confidently say that their involvement level in their own career development is extremely high. And IMU should be proud of that. I'll stop there. OK, thank you, Natasha. And uh, only one minute or two minutes left. But I, I cannot uh, finish this session without asking this question to Profar about there are a lot of debate in this uh, new norm about open book and closed book. Profar, can you summarize our today's presentation with your comments and open book and closed book in the new norm? 
Well, I think both have their roles and we are not to say that one is better than the other. Uh, it depends on what you want to access. As, uh, uh, for example, um, open book has been found to be very useful to assess uh, a student's application of knowledge. And rather than focusing the entire assessment on the ability to memorize certain facts, open book allows them to uh, uh, you know, be critical thinkers, to think about you know, the, you know, solutions for certain problems um, and giving them the opportunity to search for the relevant information to support you know, their, their answers. So I think that is the, the main role of uh, open book exams and that promotes higher order thinking. Uh, having said that, closed books should still continue because um, there are certain uh, threshold knowledge that the students should have. And they, the, the closed book will be good for uh, those kind of uh, knowledge testing. So um, the other thing that people usually talk about is like um, open book, uh, uh, just, how do we ensure that students don't cheat in open book? But one thing I want to highlight is that open book is different from remote online exams. You can have an open book exam on site under uh, invigilation. And that in during that exams, where you can make sure that the, the invigilation is, happen, uh, strict, uh, is happening strictly and the students still can have access to all these resources. So um in, in in that sense uh the the integrity of open book exam should not be a deterrent to the implementation of open book exams that's my take uh, thank you so much Prafar. I, although uh, we have we have end with time but there is a last question came from the floor that we know uh, because i am a director of learning resource so i know that uh i am you uh, we are very fortunate of i am management they spend a lot a lot of money and that is why uh, we can bring in uh, all the resources from McGraw Hill, uh, world-class resources we can bring. But the question is from one faculty that uh, what, what are actually the goal uh, they are thinking, McGraw Hill or Elsevier, that making the teaching learning modalities in an affordable manner for general student? Maybe I can go first. I think for McGraw itself is, you know, we do see that, you know, in terms of teaching and learning resources has always evolved. And I think, you know, we always working the schools to provide what, you know, what can be best solutions to help the school teachers to teach better and help learners to learn better. I think it always comes to price because yes, uh, you know, we, we definitely work with authors uh, to give them to provide content for us and they don't really write content just for free. Uh, they actually work with us with publications. Uh, and also I think in terms of affordability, uh, I think McGraw Hill has always working with Asian, Asian countries to see the price point, what can we do uh, to work with, to provide, uh, you know, maybe in, in, in my term, it's called international ed education price. I think when it comes to subscription, we also depends on, you know, the numbers of uh, databases, if there's not anything that we can give back to the university in terms of a better package. We always work closely on that. And you know, price is definitely needed because you know that is a fulfill our long-term sustainability growth to provide better resource uh, as we go towards um, the, the way of digital learning. As well, how can we actually work with you, uh, the schools and teachers to actually target the students to actually improve their grades from there as well? So, you know, that is something that we are working hand in hand. I would say, you know, in terms of that. We have been working in terms of providing COVID response. So, you know, some of the content are open war uh, with COVID. So some things that you do not need to get access, you can get content, some content about it uh, behind the, uh, in front of the paid wall. So we, we do work with hand in hand on okay. that. Okay, thank Hopefully you. Very, qui okay. Very quickly, Elsevier. Very quickly, Elsevier's response. Yeah, sure. Uh, I think this was a similar question in the chat as well. We are cautiously working towards making our platforms more and more accessible and affordable. We've been working with universities in the past few months um, to provide our platforms at uh, 
free pilot model or low cost model so that universities can continue their education. I think the most important thing to bear in mind is how can we continue education during these difficult times? In fact, I would say times have changed. Things are not as difficult as what they used to be. Now it's more about embracing all the things we've talked about since morning, be it AI, be it machine learning, be it all sorts of new care, uh, care delivery models and education models. It's now time to think about how will we embrace them. Of course, cost is an important aspect of that. But I think we in Malaysia, especially, we are past the challenges of COVID and we are now ready to look ahead. So I would encourage all our audience to think ahead and give us feedback on how we can support you in thinking ahead. That's what okay. I would like. Okay, thank you. Me. Thank you, Prof. Harvey Meng. Thank you, Tasha uh, Gulati. And thank you, Kevin Ong. Uh, it has been a very uh, a good session and I hope we have touched all the important aspects of new norm in education. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.